Hello and welcome to today's video. Today I'm going to talk to you about SIBO and digestive problems and I'm going to help you see the five most common root causes. So the root cause being the the influencing factor that actually caused the the, the disease or the onset of of symptoms. And if you want to if you want to fix SIBO, you really have to understand that if you want to fix any any health problem, you have to understand the root cause the root cause is the thing that caused the disease to happen and if you don't understand how it happened you are never I mean, a few people do but it's very rare that you're going to fix it you really have to truly understand a problem if you want to find a solution to it and these in my experience i would say that i've helped over a thousand people with digestive problems and let's say at least 900 of them have one of these five root causes that I'm going to share with you today. So one in 10, maybe you're not on this list, but nine out of 10, 90% chance you, this is going to be you. So this is one of these is going to be your root cause. And we need to fix this. Otherwise, SIBO will become a, a chronic recurrent thing that even if you treat it, it will, it will never go away. If you want help with, with that side of things, in order to talk about like the approach to take with SIBO, I have plenty of other videos on my YouTube channel. Just literally, you go on YouTube, search William Dickinson SIBO, like whole gut health playlist, bunch of videos there. But today I want to talk to you about the five root causes and we're going to figure out what your one is. So just before I start, I have to just check, do a quick mic check. Perfect. Very great. Cool. So for the, the this I'm gonna this is in no particular order, but this this one in particular is the one that I find is most common. And this is mine as well. So this is uh this is one I know a lot about. This is mold. So mold is a really common root cause of SIBO. I will tell you, if you are trying to fix SIBO, and this this goes for SIBO, this goes for CIFO, I'm going to say, if you have any digestive problem at all, and you're trying to heal in a moldy environment, every single penny that you have, every single cent, every dollar should go towards a safe living environment. It's like you're pushing a boulder up a mountain. And healing is really hard, and it takes a lot of effort and a lot of work, and it's really challenging if you're staying in an environment that's keeping you sick. If you're not sure if mold is a factor for you, the best way to test is to do an organic acids urine test with a mycotoxin panel. In the organic acids uh, test itself, you'd be looking for markers like high oxalate can be an indicator that you've got some mold. You could look for the avabinose, which is one of the other markers. These two are usually elevated if you have mold or mold colonization. So these are things you can look at. But I would also add the mycotoxin panel where they're specifically measuring the level of mycotoxins that are being excreted in the urine. If you're going to do this test, the best thing you can do is have a hot bath or a sauna session the night before and you collect your urine first thing in the morning. This will give you the most accurate reading. Because remember, when you're testing your urine, you're not testing what's in your body. You're testing what your body is removing. And having a, a, a heat exposure the night before drastically, significantly increases the excretion of urinary mycotoxins. So do that if you're going to do that, do that test. <clears throat> Every, everything you do to try and heal SIBO while you're still being exposed, exposed to mycotoxins will be in vain. You are pushing a boulder up a mountain. And if you change the environment, instead of pushing a boulder up a mountain, you're pushing it on flat ground for a little while, and then it's a downhill slope. And you don't even have to do much work. You just you just stay in your in your Goldilocks zone. You just stay in a way where you feel good and your body is just healing passively as the days go by. So most common root cause in my experience is is mold. And if that's a problem for you, you that really needs to be addressed. Next, and I would say this is actually the second most common. So it looks like we are kind of going in order of of how of how common this is. So so that that's the order of this list. We're going I've got it written down here. We're going from most common to least common. But and there are others that don't fit in this list. But second is antibiotics and this like no surprise right well maybe because you hear SIBO and you think overgrowth you think overgrowth in the small intestine SIBO is a terrible diagnostic label I I hate it I hate the fact that that it's called SIBO because when you hear SIBO you think small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and you think oh if it's overgrowing just you just have to kill it and it if that was if that made sense then antibiotics would work and they don't a lot of people try treating with so i also did this you know i had the mold root cause and i had SIBO oops sorry about that and i had SIBO so i was like okay what do you do with SIBO did you take antibiotics so i took rifaximin i took metronidazole had the constipation side and it didn't work it actually 
completely destroyed my microbiome even further. And the already bad health problems I was having were made a million times worse. From this, I developed severe histamine intolerance. I developed like a really deep chronic fatigue syndrome. You know, I couldn't even, I literally went like days without brushing my teeth. And when you don't have any energy, you're like, I don't really care. I'm just trying to stay alive. You know, personal hygiene definitely took a hit. I had a full-time carer. I was disabled, you know, and that's from the mold and then throw the antibiotics on top. But antibiotics can really cause SIBO because it damages the, the this very careful balance of your microbiome. SIBO, we should destroy that word. SIBO, I hate it. Change it to small intestinal dysbiosis. Think about it as an imbalance. It doesn't matter if something's overgrown. If something's overgrown, then it means something else is undergrown. Or there's some kind of imbalance happening in the gut somewhere. Throw SIBO out the window. It's, I hate it. It's not helpful whatsoever. Look at it as a dysbiosis situation. And if we can correct the dysbiosis, in the case of, of having one of the root causes being antibiotics, you're really going to be looking at probiotics. And this is another reason I hate SIBO, as you think. SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Why would I put probiotics in a bacterial overgrowth? It doesn't make any sense. It's a bad label. Change it to small intestinal dysbiosis, and you think, oh, there's an imbalance. I need to bring balance back. Probiotics can be really helpful for that. If you have mold or... So mo most molds are actually antibiotics. Think about how penicillin was discovered. You've probably heard that story. And if you haven't, go on Google. How was penicillin discovered? It's basically mold growing on an orange. So you've got mold, you've basically got a chronic antibiotic exposure, and antibiotics is the second most common root cause. Third in this list of common causes for, for digestive problems and SIBO, we've got amalgam fillings and uh, dental problems. So the, the really common presentation I see here is a SIBO, but very often it's a a combination of like a gastritis, like a, a, a an intest, like a, a, an irritation of the stomach lining, and this can be with reflux or without. This can be with gastroparesis or without, but generally, almost always, an irritation of the stomach lining, and obviously, either amalgam fillings in the mouth or a history of amalgam fillings. Maybe they've been removed or poor dental work, as in have cavitations or root canals or um, like bacterial problems in the mouth basically it's basically an oral dysbiosis that's caused by uh, different 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 factors so what you usually see is irritation of the stomach lining and then uh, you usually will also find h pylori and candida will will grow they will grow because they're trying to break these toxins down they're trying to break down these these like very very high level toxic compounds that are coming through your mouth into your digestive system they're trying to break it down into less toxic compounds, which they do, but they irritate the stomach lining in the process. So anytime I'm looking at someone that's got a H. pylori presentation, a gastritis um, kind of presentation, you're always looking at the teeth first. And if you've got poor dental hygiene, we have to kind of work on that. We really have to improve that. There's a lot you can do, but you're really going to have to work with a biodentist if you've got some serious problems there. That You really, really, really need to work with somebody that can, can really fix this there's even a documentary or a book called like root cause you know because of root canals you know your teeth are very very important anything that's happening here is affecting what's happening down there so fourth fourth most common we have food poisoning so this would kind of come under the label of like post-infectious ibs whereby you develop irritable bowel syndrome or, or SIBO or some kind of gut problem after you have a food point a food poisoning incident so when you have a food a food poisoning incident and it's very interesting because in a way this is also not a root cause there's there's always something underlying this but this is a kind of like a call to action to look at the digestive function to look at your five pillars as in five pillars being the five primary core indivisible functions of your digestive system if you've watched my videos before you already know what the five pillars are if you're new they are your stomach acid you've probably heard of these but maybe not in this context stomach acid digestive enzymes, bile, motility, and mucosa. These are the five core, like, primary functions of your digestive system. If you look at the whole digestive system and how it works, basically 80% of the mechanics fit into these five pillars. And these five pillars are, are laid on a foundation of a healthy microbiome. So if you get food poisoning, either your stomach acid was low and it allowed a pathogen to overgrow, you've got uh, an enzyme deficiency, your bile isn't flowing correctly, it's thick, it's sluggish, it's not working properly, you have a, a motility problem, as in it couldn't move the bacteria correctly, 
or you've got uh, a mucosal problem, like leaky gut kind of situation. So what, what tends to happen here is you have a, a bout of, of food poisoning, as in you like, you most people will get diarrhea when they have food poisoning, and maybe they're vomiting as well. And then sometimes this just continues, and it never goes away, and you just have diarrhea forever. That's your body still trying to clear this infection. But what generally tends to happen is the body kind of runs out of resources. It runs out of energy. Maybe it runs out of calories because it's having diarrhea all the time. Maybe it runs out of nutrients. It just can't maintain this kind of immune response. Usually the tendency is to then swap over into constipation. And from that point, you then go constipated. And this is because you've lost so much of your microflora and you've created such a big imbalance and a big dysbiosis. You basically create a deficiency of the, of the healthy bugs that make your gut work correctly and that were stimulating that immune response. So... That's a, not quite a characteristic presentation either, continuing in the diarrhea nonstop until the body is completely depleted and then you move into more of a, a constipation kind of presentation. So that's really interesting that you see SIBO, you've got like SIBO hydrogen, SIBO methane. So you've got the, the diarrhea and the constipation. There's a, there's a parallel there. There's some investigation to do. And finally, this, this final uh, root cause, I would say this often... This is, a, this is an interesting one because you can have this one on top of all of the other ones. And there's a very good likelihood that if you do have one of these other root causes that I've mentioned, you probably have something here too. This last one is trauma. This is the emotional root cause. So, for example, a lot of people can avoid food poisoning simply by listening to their appetite and avoiding eating food when their body tells them not to. Your body's intelligent. It can feel when there's like bad bugs in some food. And if you're really tapped into your intuition, you just don't eat it. Everyone else eats it, they all get sick, and you're, and you're okay. I've had that happen to me several times. And I've had other times when I've eaten food, when I've been not so in touch with myself, and, I, and I've got myself sick. So there's, there's a, a, a really easy analogy to think about this. You know, And I'm talking to you like you're a five-year-old child, because when you're talking about trauma, this is the best way to do it. If you have undigested emotions, if you have experience in your life, so digestion is a process where we put a food in, or we, we, we experience something, and then we're able to break it all the way down. So instead of it being like a pizza, right, instead of having a whole slice of pizza just sitting in your gut, you've got little molecules of gluten, you've got little molecules of starch, you've got little like amino acids that the pepperoni has been broken down to. You've got all these individual little tiny, tiny, tiny single, single mononutrients. So that's the digestion. So that's the breaking it down. And then the second stage is the absorption, where all these little individual nutrients need to be absorbed, like one at a time. They get, they get, they get, your, your, your intestine is very smart. It has these selective receptors that are like, I want you inside my body. I want you inside my body. Oh, look, there's some zinc. Oh, look, there's some magnesium. Oh, look, there's a, there's a tyrosine molecule. Oh, we'll have that. You know, and it selects and it chooses. And that needs to happen with emotional experiences too. If you have something that happens that is traumatic, and you cannot understand it. You cannot break it down into these tiny little, these little pieces and then absorb them and then turn these little pieces into you. Imagine like that's what happens on a physical level. You know, you break down that starch molecule, you turn it into energy. You break down that glutamine molecule, you turn it into a piece of your gut lining. If you had trauma or if you had experiences in your life that you haven't been able to fully break down and understand, like you don't have the emotional intelligence to process or ex or or fully experience what happened to you and then take from that experience and use it to turn you into the person that you that you could be or that you're supposed to be or that you have the potential to be if you can't do that emotionally or energetically it puts a massive burden on the physical digestive function and you will you will have SIBO you will have low enzymes you'll have low stomach acid because your body is full of unprocessed experiences it's it's full and it's very common to not have much of an appetite in a, in a situation like this. So I can tell you, in my case, I had the mold. I had the antibiotics. I didn't have the food poisoning. But maybe I did. I don't really know. But I don't think I did. But I had, I had a lot of trauma. I had so much trauma that I had to work through. And working on the microbiome and doing all the physical things only got me so far. It was when I really addressed that emotional root cause and that trauma aspect of the situation that things really began to change. So five most common root causes. Um... And this is in order of the order that I see them. Mold is the most common. If you're in a moldy environment, do something about it. It's not going to change by itself. I know it can feel overwhelming. I know it can feel insurmountable, but it isn't. You can do something about it. Antibiotics. If you have a dysbiosis caused by antibiotics, probiotics are probably going to be an essential part of your recovery. So figure out what that's going to look like for you. 
third, amalgams and, and poor dental work. You need to work with a biological dentist. You cannot trust mainstream dentistry to take care of these kinds of problems. They, they do not acknowledge that like fluoride is toxic. They do not acknowledge that, that mercury can cause these problems. They do not acknowledge it. So you cannot trust them with, with your health. So find a biological dentist that understands how these things are harmful and get them use a smart dentist to get these things removed and get these, get these things fixed. Food poisoning. You're probably going to need to work on the five pillars. So st stomach acid, digestive enzymes, bile, motility, and mucosa. I have a course that goes more into detail in this. If you're interested, you can go on Google and type William Dickinson, gut health bundle. There's a bunch of resources in there. If you've liked this video so far, you will absolutely love it. So if you want to work on your gut, that's a really nice place to go. Finally, emotions, address the emotional root cause. This looks different for everybody. I can tell you that what's been really helpful for me has been somatic work and something called family constellations. I also have a video on these, both of these topics on YouTube in one video. You can go on YouTube again and search William Dickinson, how to heal trauma. I have a whole video that talks about both of those modalities in a lot more detail. And it also helps you understand how trauma actually causes uh, disease. Georgie Porgy says, hello, William. Nice to see you, Georgie. We're just finishing up. So if anyone has any questions, please let me know. I've got a, um, I've got an appointment, so I have to go. But I hope you found this really helpful. If you, yeah, like I said, if you have any questions, please leave them. Please let me know. I, I really love to help. I want you to feel good. I want you to heal. You don't have to just live the rest of your life just feeling like crap. You know, you can, you have so much potential. You can, you can do it. So if I can help you in any way, please let me know. And if you have any questions, leave them, leave them for me below. I'm, I'm quite healthy now. So I'm going to go and live my life. I'm going to go have fun. I'm going to go meet some friends and maybe like have some coffee or like just, just like be alive and not have to have a chronic disease for a bit. So I will, I will see you later. So take care. Hope you, hope you have a good one and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.